the opportunity to be able to meet together because in speaking with some people overseas, they don't have this privilege. They don't have the opportunity that we have. So we give God thanks. We give God thanks for so many different blessings that we have here in these Cayman Islands. Welcome. If you've, if you've been with us over the last two Sundays, hopefully you've enjoyed your time with us and we've continued in our theme from here to eternity. And we have been in a series on Psalm 23. Now, I'd like to invite you, as we've been doing over the past few weeks, to stand with me and to read this psalm, this beautiful psalm together. It can be found on page 544 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. Or feel free to recite it from memory. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Eternal Heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord, asking for your guidance, for your strength, for your wisdom, Lord, as we unpack this wonderful psalm. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the way in which you use it in our lives. Now, Lord, I pray that you would make the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord. Use this broken vessel to bring forth your perfect word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Yes. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> in the first week, Pastor Bentley ably led us through verses one through three and gave us the exhortation to not allow our familiarity with, the well, with this well-known psalm to make us miss the depth of the meaning that is in it. He also gave us the charge to understand and know the Lord as our personal shepherd. This rich message rang through that when I know the Lord as my shepherd, as my personal shepherd, I shall not want a, a better shepherd. I shall not need a better provider. The great shepherd is all sufficient and I have no need of anyone else. He also gave us the charge that is only once, that is only at the time that we come to know the Lord as our personal shepherd, that we can receive Christ as our savior and that we can claim the rest of this psalm. Last week we had the privilege of having Pastor Stephen took a, taking, us, taking us through um, verses five, four and five as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He shared his own near death experience and the tragic loss of his best friend and how the Lord ministered to him through those experiences. He reminded us that the valley often comes upon us suddenly, but it's not a surprise to the good shepherd. He also challenged us to keep our focus on the Lord and to keep moving forward with the Lord as he walks with us through the valley at his measured pace. Today, we come to the conclusion of this beloved psalm, but indeed, it is the beginning of the great charge to the Christian to not lose sight of our good shepherd in the daily walk of life. It's a reminder to us that we have hope in Jesus Christ as our good shepherd. So my question to you today, and the question that I hope to answer, is how do we find hope in the humdrum, in the regular routine stuff of life? You see, 
God is not only our personal shepherd who leads us through the valley, that when we're going through that time of despair and we feel as if we can't lift our head and we can't go on, as Christians, we must be reminded that our shepherd is also interested in the details of our lives and that he is our redeemer, our savior, our protector, our provider, and our friend. You see, we may know that we need a good shepherd when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but often we forget that we need that same shepherd when we are walking through the office and just trying to get through the shadow of a Monday morning. <laughs> the prophet said it well in Lamentations 3, to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Today I'd like to focus on three points to try to drive this home. First one is we can find hope in the certainty of Christ. The second one is we can find hope in the love and goodness of Christ. And finally, we can find hope in eternity with Christ. Surely, hmm, surely. It's a very interesting choice of words. And I'm sure the biblical use of this word is probably lost on us today. It's not really a word that we, would he that we hear regularly. We don't usually preface our, our statements by saying, surely I will come to this party. At least I don't. <laughs> Some of the common synonyms for, for surely, um, you know, there are certainly, definitely, undoubtedly, to name a few. In all that we face today, we may be more used to using or hearing words like probably, or maybe, or even potentially. And sometimes, simply the phrase, we'll see what happens. But I don't really recall many people, at least recently, add a reassurance to a statement by using surely. Surely. Hmm. This small but effective word that David uses in verse 6 is very important. You see, because it sets the stage for what he is about to say next. But it also captions what he said before. At this point in the psalm, David has expressed praise for his shepherd leading and guiding him through the times of peace, times of safety, times of quietness, even for the time of restoration. The good shepherd has taken David through the valley of the shadow of death, and he has confront, comforted, he has been comforted by the shepherd's rod and staff. A table of abundance has been prepared in the presence of his enemies. His head has been anointed with oil, and his cup of blessings is overflowing. Now, in verse 6, David shifts his focus to daily living and the goodness and love of God following him all the days of his life. In making this statement, it's as if David turns his eyes toward heaven and says, Lord, in light of all that you, my good shepherd, have brought me through and the way you have cared for me in my times of despair and suffering, I now declare surely confidently, with absolute certainty, undoubtedly, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will experience your blessings forever. You see, we don't often hear those type of words, especially in today, today's world. As so many of the speakers before me have said, our world is uncertain. And that's probably why we don't hear this word, surely. We don't hear certainty or certainly, but we hear probably. You see, our lives are filled with uncertainty. We've often been let down by friends, by family, by coworkers. We've been left hanging, waiting for that friend or loved one to show up to lunch, only to get a message 15 minutes later. 
saying, I'm, I got busy, sorry, I can't make it. In the busyness of life, we forget about important appointments, we neglect our families, we forget birthdays and important occasions. It even extends to when we plan meetings. Sometimes we will send a meeting request and you know, just put the location as TBD or to be determined. Mainly because we are uncertain of where we will be meeting <laughs> or even if we'll be meeting at all. We make plans, but often those plans are shifted, rescheduled, or even canceled. Even more so considering COVID-19 and the uncertainty of what will happen next. I don't know about you, but I don't have a tendency to plan too far ahead in these uncertain times. In October, my family was in the process of planning our son Keon's 11th birthday party. We already knew that we had to restrict the number of people that could attend and so we only sent out a limited number of invitations. As Keon eagerly awaited the day of the party, he grew more and more excited about the prospect of hanging out with, with his friends and just having a good time. Sadly, as more and more children contracted COVID-19 and classmates, families, and even entire schools were put into quarantine, less and less people were able to attend the party. We pushed the date back, hoping for a change, but it was all too uncertain, and we couldn't risk it. We finally decided to just have a small gathering with our immediate family, we had a great time. But it gave us an opportunity to try to speak to Keon and explain about this uncertainty in life. Later in, the, in October, we, plan, we once again planned a birthday celebration and planned a staycation for my wife's birthday. And lo and behold, our plans were impacted when our daughter contracted COVID-19. And here again, we had to alter our plans. I'm sure many of us will have similar or even worse stories of how this uncertainty surrounding COVID-19 has impacted our lives and how we have had to adjust and adapt to this new normal. You see, if we're not careful, we may actually start to believe that right now, the only certainty that we have is that we live in uncertain times. This is dangerous. This is a dangerous place to be because you see, we take our focus off of our shepherd. We forget the certainty of his goodness and his love. This only allows fear to step in. And you know what? The next thing we know, we're back in the valley. The devil wants nothing more than for us to stay in a state of fear and doubt. This, fertile ground for sin, this is fertile ground for the sin in our lives to grow. Unfortunately, when we are in the midst of daily trials, we sometimes forget who we are in Christ. We cannot allow this to happen. We cannot allow this fear to creep in. Our proper response is to rest in the hope that we have in the certainty of Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the risen lamb, the savior of the world. See, sometimes we forget that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit, he helps us in our weakness. We have been given tools to fight. The weapons that we use are the spiritual weapons. And we need to fight fear and doubt in our daily challenges, wearing the full armor of God. We must remember Paul's words in Romans 8, verse 37 to 38, when answering the question of what will separate us from the love of Christ. This is how he responds. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is the certainty we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Hebrews 13, 8 tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. You see, we need this wonderful reminder. We need to understand that in the constant shifting in our lives, Jesus is consistent. Jesus never changes. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And he's a friend. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. My charge to you today is find hope in the certainty of Christ in the daily grind of life. If we trust him in the routine things in life, we are better prepared for the greater battles ahead. And this brings me to my second point. How do we find hope in this love and this goodness that this psalm talks about? All of my days. Hmm. All of my days? All the days of my life. Hmm. The days aren't looking too good, Lord. Things are rough. <laughs> I know people who've lost their jobs. I know people that are hurting. I know people that aren't able to make it, Lord. Where's the love? Where's the goodness, Lord? I'm just asking the questions that you want to ask. <laughs> you see, sometimes I think when, I, when we read this, the words goodness and love are somewhat trivialized in our common language. And our issue is that we don't have the right perspective on goodness and love. So we don't appreciate what David is saying here. We use the word good and love to describe things that are very common in life, such as the food was good, probably meaning it wasn't great, but it was okay. In Hebrew, the word typically used for good has a broad meaning, but includes beautiful, the attractive, the useful, the profitable, the desirable, the morally right. Similarly in Greek, the two words typically used to describe something as good were chosen to describe moral goodness. And I will always leave the, the pronunciation to Pastor Steve. <laughs> At the creation of the world, God even describes his mighty works as good. In doing this, he made the declaration that it was complete, that it was sufficient for the purpose and beneficial. So we can see here that the word being used in the biblical sense does not mean what we think it means, like mediocre or not as good as it should be. You see, I think we don't have the right perspective on what David is saying here. In Mark 10, 18, Jesus declared that no one is good except God alone. James, James 1, 17 shows us that the Lord is the source of goodness. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And even Nahum chapter 1, verse 7 declares, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Similarly, we often lose the true meaning of the word love because we use it so flippantly. We say that we love everything from the weather to bunnies to a new pair of shoes. <laughs> when, we, when we read Psalms like Psalm 136, this echoes the words of 1 Chronicles 16, 34. And we see that the opening words of this Psalm speaks of God's goodness and the refrain of this psalm is, his love endures forever. The Lord himself is the definition of love and goodness. And all throughout scripture, we see references to these two characteristics of God's nature. 
God's love and goodness are intertwined. And the ultimate demonstration of God's love and goodness is in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. 1 John 4.10 says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Romans 5 verse 8 reminds us that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In particular, I love that verse. Because you see, God didn't wait for us. He already made a way. He put a plan in place from the time of the fall to save us. That's the God we serve. That's the God that we need to find hope in. That's the God that we need to tell a dying world that they need to serve and that they can find peace and hope and joy and satisfaction in. Because I can guarantee you, you're not finding it out there. These verses fly in the face of what the world offers as advice. And you know, oftentimes, when we're faced with struggles and when we're faced with things, you know, just in the humdrum of life or we're dealing with a difficult situation, we find comfort in music. Some of you may know the song, Everybody Hurts. I'm dating myself here a bit, but, you know, it's by the group R.E.M. Some of you might remember it. It was a very popular song and actually spent 20 weeks on the Billboard charts in 1994. Let's listen to some of the words. I won't sing it. Sometimes everything is wrong. When your day is night alone, if you feel like letting go, hold on. If you think you've had too much of this life, well, hang on. If you feel like letting go, hold on. When you think you've had too much of this life to hang on, well, everybody hurts sometimes. Everybody cries. And everybody hurts sometimes. So hold on, hold on. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this song and feel a sense of comfort. But you see, we must be careful. <laughs> the artist here is telling us to hold on. But hold on to what exactly? To whom? You see, it's, we're left with that question. What are we holding on to? This is the hope that the world offers. No, I'm not here to judge the artist. I don't know what the artist's view is on Christianity. But I do know that yes, everybody hurts sometimes, but we do not need to experience this hurt alone. We need to hold on to the goodness and mercy and love of Jesus Christ. We have the awesome privilege of holding on to the good shepherd that says that he is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in time of trouble. That's what I want to hold on to. Now let me contrast this with a song that actually answers the questions left lingering by that song. Some days are weary and you can't see your way. Some nights are lonely with no one to say, you can make it. This is only a test. You can take it. And don't you think nothing less? So wipe the tears from your eyes. God's on your side. Hold on. Don't quit. God's on your side. He can handle it. God's on your side. You see, just in the, in the basic use of songs, you can see the contrast between what the world is offering us and what God has already ordained and placed in his word for us. The truth behind these songs are that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We have hope, we have joy, we have peace in the one that is the author of hope, joy, and peace. This song is a song of hope because it speaks of this one true God who is hope. If you're here today, and you're not a Christian, what are you holding on to? 
Where is your hope found? Are you just moving from trial to trial? From one problem to the next? Yes. Everybody hurts sometimes. But who you rely on and what you do during those times could make the difference between an eternity with God or being separated from him. As an aside, what's, what's ironic is that when I was looking up the lyrics to this song, what surrounded the lyrics were videos of rap artists and their life's journey. You see, this is how quickly the world would try to distract us and lure us in. Oh, great. Kyle, now you're saying that all secular music is bad and all that I can listen to is listen to our hymns and Christian music all day, every day. No, it's actually a, a, a plea to come to join the choir. <laughs> you see, while that wouldn't be bad, it wouldn't be a bad thing for, you to, for us to, to, to listen to Christian music all day long. But that's not what I'm saying here. See, I face this a lot when I'm counseling teenagers. I'm not here to condemn you nor your musical choices. That's the Holy Spirit's job. What I am saying, though, is to be mindful of what you are filling your mind with. Be mindful of the message that you are constantly hearing and the music that you are listening to. What you are watching and the shows and the movies that you are, that you are actually paying attention to. If you are meandering down a path of negativity, change your playlist. Change your watch list. There, is, there are an abundant amount of resources, Christian resources that you can tap into that will help you. Listen to something different. Listen to God on, God's on your side. Maybe a little bit more, you know, Christian music and less Cardi B. Just saying. <laughs> not only are we to find hope in the love and goodness of God, not that anyone listens to Cardi B in here, of course, um, but we are called to share this love and goodness with others. I'd like to share how this played out practically in my life. When I was admitted to the hospital in the height of the 2020 lockdown, and how the hands and feet of Jesus were at work, and how this love and this goodness followed me. 5%. As I sat in my hospital room, little did I know the hands and feet of Jesus were already at work on my behalf. I was admitted to the hospital after coming into the ER due to, the, due to chest pain and just not feeling well. But the story doesn't start there. The day before, I received a call from Pastor Steve checking in on our family. I also received a message from Pastor Dave, also checking in on our family. Sitting in the ER, I received a message from Juliet Osborne. The message read, the Lord is faithful, Kyle. I know he's keeping you now. I know because he told me so. Pastor Steve, Pastor Dave, nor I for that matter, knew that the next evening, around the same time, I would be in the ER. In the moment that I was in the ER, Juliet didn't know where I was, but she sent a timely message. This is evidence of the goodness and the mercies and the love of God following us. Along with my sister-in-law at home with the kids, Felicia by my side, breaching hospital protocol, I was experiencing true love in action. I praise God for the body of Christ. By the time all of the tests in the ER were done and the doctors had made their decision to admit me, it was 12 a.m. I was not prepared to stay overnight. I didn't bring anything that I would need, including a phone charger. I had already put my phone on low power mode to conserve the battery. I looked over at my already exhausted wife and knew that I couldn't ask her to do anything more. She had already done so much. With all the restrictions in place due to COVID-19 measures, there was no way she could go home and get, come back in that, at that late hour. As I was ushered into my room, I realized with all the hospital protocols in place, 
that my only connection to my family and the outside world would be my phone. As I made calls, sent messages, read, etc., I watched my battery life reduce. Every phone call was cut short. All efforts were made to conserve battery life. By the next day, despite shutting down everything and restricting interaction, my phone battery continued to, to go down as expected. Felicia was at home with the kids. She had her fair share of work to do to get them up and ready to come out. Little did I know a plan of action was already in place. 5%. 5%. I watched my phone go down to 5%. And even though it had only been a few hours being isolated, I wanted to see what was happening in the outside world. I wanted to know what was happening to the people around me. I wanted to, wanted to be able to check on people as well. I already felt disconnected and now I'm being disconnected from the virtual world as well. While I don't use social media very often, I wanted to make sure that I was still connected. I started to feel a bit of despair. And you see, when you put things into perspective, this is a minor thing, but it became a major thing when I didn't have connection with my family, with my friends, and I was all alone. The nurses themselves couldn't even come in because they had to wear so much PPE that they, they, they couldn't risk using all of their stock. In comes a message from, from Felicia. Juline from church is at work today and will lend you her charger till I bring yours. Martha Buford arranged it. You see, little did I know, God's goodness and mercy was following me. Little did I know, the hands and feet of Jesus were already at work on my behalf. One message, one touch point with the body of Christ, and there is a response. You see, this is how we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus. This comes true when we're faced with all kinds of different issues. This is but one instance. But when we need, we need to stop and really see God's goodness and mercy in the everyday things of our lives. When that person stops by your office and shares a word and prays with you and lifts up your soul that you're left speechless because you don't even know how to respond. That's the goodness and mercy of God in our everyday struggles. We cannot lose sight of this. Not only are we to find hope in the love and goodness of God, but we are called to share this. We have to share it. We experience it and we share it. As Christians, his promise here in Psalm 23 is that his goodness and mercy and love will follow us all the days of our lives. No matter what we face, we have a hope that can only be found in him. And this brings me to my third point, this hope that we have for eternity with Christ. This past summer, you may recall, we had a VBS, and the name was Concrete and Cranes. Now, I know everybody wants to sing the song, but let's just hold off for a bit, maybe afterwards. <laughs> and the major theme was Jesus, our strong foundation. The key verse of the week was Philippians 1, verse 6, which says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We had an awesome opportunity to share this with children and to help them to build this in their lives, to come to understand that Jesus is our strong foundation. There's no other foundation that is worth even pursuing. This is an important concept, and we must realize how profound this is in the world that we live in today. The fact that we have a Savior that not only saves us, but also sustains us until he returns, that is amazing. That is an amazing truth. In a time when, we may, when, when many may feel attacked on all fronts and desperate for a way forward, this hope that we have as Christians, we need to profess this. Because you know why? 
It can be a balm to heal many wounds. Most importantly, the wounds of sin. Today, we celebrate the first day of the Advent season. And today, we lit the candle of hope. We begin the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the hope for a weary world. The fact that he stepped into our world to save us from our sins. We celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. We have a job to do, Christians. We have a job to do. We must tell the world that there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope when it seems like there is no hope at all. We must be prepared to proclaim that Jesus is always enough. The end of verse 6 is a verse of great reward that one day we will meet our Savior face to face and we will dwell in his house forever. In John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus gave us these beautiful words of hope. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have, not, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. If you're here today, that means the Lord isn't finished with you yet. If you're here, you have the breath of life. It's flowing through your lungs. You may feel hard pressed on every side, but you have not been crushed. You may feel perplexed, but do not be in despair. You may feel persecuted, but you have not been abandoned. You may feel struck down, but praise God, you are not destroyed. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair. That when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Savior there. Through present sufferings, future's fear, he whispers courage in my ear. For I am safe in everlasting arms, and they will lead me home. We have a sure and certain hope in Jesus Christ through his finished work on the cross. This is what we need to get out there in the world. This is the message that we need to share with all of the people who are hurting, who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you're here today, you don't know about this hope. You've never experienced it. We would want nothing more than to share this with you. Please, don't leave the way you came in. Today is the day of salvation. Come. Come to know Jesus. Come to understand who he is. How he can change a sinner to being saved. How he can change your life from being broken down and busted to being lifted up and trusted. You see, you have to understand, when the Lord makes a change in your life, he doesn't mess around. He changes you for his purposes. And I can guarantee you, I have no reason, I have no right to be here for the things that I've done. But the Lord, but the Lord, but the Lord, through his saving grace, he turned my life around. He changed me. He can change anyone. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That is a promise. That is the hope that we have. 
that we are cleansed by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we close today, let us be reminded that Jesus is a good shepherd who sustains us each and every day. He gives us the breath of life, providing for all of our needs, getting us through the practical, regular, routine, or humdrum parts of life, giving us strength for everyday trials that we face, and the promise that he will continue to do so forever. I'm not gonna presume that I know what you're, face, what you're facing today. I don't know what you're going through and what struggle you're dealing with, but God does. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ and surrendered your life to him, then he is your shepherd. And this psalm is an assurance of hope and a reminder that his love and goodness will follow you all the days of your life. All of the days of your life. If you haven't yet committed your life to the Lord, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting to get to the valley? Or are you waiting to get out of the valley? Because this psalm tells us, it says, even though I walk through the valley, as Stephen reminded us, we will all walk through a valley at some point. It's who we're walking with and how we walk that will make the difference. So what are you waiting for? Are you waiting to get to the valley or are you waiting to get through the valley? The Lord is the good shepherd. And what he is telling us here is that he prepares us before the valley. He leads us through the valley. And then he preserves us for the rest of our lives until the day when we will all see his face in heaven. When Revelation tells us that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. My charge to you today is to find hope in Jesus Christ. Turn away from what the world is feeding you. Turn away from what it is that the the poison that is in the world telling you to hold fast to things that are not there. Hold fast to our ever-present and living hope, Jesus Christ. If you want to find out more about this, please come and see us after the service. Come up during the service, whatever you want to do, but just give your, Lord, give, give your life to the Lord. <laughs> find hope in Jesus Christ, the Lord who loves us forevermore forevermore, now and always. Let us pray. Eternal, all-sufficient God, we thank you, Lord, for your divine blessings in our lives, Lord. We thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are our hope, I thank you, Father, for sending Jesus Christ into the world to save us from our sins. Lord, I thank you that during this time of Advent, we can celebrate this hope that we have, that the light has come into a world of darkness. Jesus Christ, our light and our salvation has come. And Lord, I pray that the di a dying world will hear this message and come to know you. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done, Lord, in our islands and throughout all the years and preserving us. Help us to never take our eyes off of you in the everyday struggles that we face. Guide us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.